Hello everybody, this is After the Oligarchy. Today I'm speaking with Professor Robin Hanel. Robin Hanel is a professor of economics in the United States, co-founder with Michael Albert of the post-capitalist model known as participatory economics, and author of many books. Today's conversation is in association with META, the Center for Post-Capitalist Civilization. This is part B of the first interview in a series of interviews with Professor Robin Hanel about participatory economics and in particular his latest book, Democratic Economic Planning, published in 2021. It's an advanced discussion of the model proposed in that book, so I recommend you familiarize yourself with participatory economics to understand what we're talking about. The discussion will also continue on the forum of participatoryeconomy.org. Okay, so the next question, staying on consumption, is about excessive consumption and the possibilities of this in participatory economy. So firstly, on the side of consumer councils, since consumer federations organize consumption, for example, through shopping centers and online shops, consumer federations will decide how to present and in general market goods and services. Will there be any incentive to oversell for example, to convince people to buy things they don't need or want. Okay, so I, I warned you before that you'd pick the two things that that I am the least. Well, I just put it my my least favorite subjects. Well, your your intellectual honesty is always is always appreciated. <laughs> That's how we like to do things here. But but just whatever comes to mind is good enough. I'll give you my best answer, but I'll preface it by saying that I don't shop. Right. <laughs> I don't go shopping. I hate shopping. Right. <laughs> I have always found somebody else who will do the shopping for me. The only thing I enjoy shopping for is I cook and I go into stores and I shop for food, clothes, anything else. There was a time when I would go into bookstores, but now we don't read books anymore. Um, they're all <laughs> online. So I, I am not a shopper. And at one point, I had a group of there, there was there were three female students in one of my classes, and I have been doing to be done a little section on participatory economics and they came in during office hours three of them together it was like a delegation <laughs> and, and they came in and they said well professor hanel there's a lot of things we really do like you know about what you're proposing here but there's one thing we just don't like i mean we really you don't seem to understand the pleasures of mauling it <laughs> <laughs> and at first, I didn't even understand what the word, I didn't know what they were, what they meant when they said mall. Yeah, and yeah. they meant going to a mall yeah. and seeing and being seen and spending four hours, you know, after school or after work at the mall. And that they were basically telling me, some of us really like that. And we just want to know whether we're going to be able to do that in a participatory economy. Yeah. <laughs> and I had to say, well, your dream is my nightmare. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. <laughs> the fact that I would be trapped in a mall for five hours, you know, is sort of the worst thing that could ever happen to me. And so I'm going to admit to you that anybody who enjoys the pleasure of shopping, at least this person who designed this economy did not have you in mind because it's the farthest thing from my mind. But I do just think that structurally, almost by accident, I was concerned with the perverse incentive for sellers to lie to people about how good their products are. And I mean, that's a huge feature of capitalism. I thought, well, why don't we reverse who's in charge of sort of explaining to people what the properties of different options are? Why don't we put the consumer federations, you know, why don't we assign them that role rather than, you know, put producers in the situation where they're constantly trying to convince somebody you know, to buy something, they're, they're overselling, you know, the value of the, the value to the consumer. Let's just, let's get the incentives right by saying, and, and that's, so I, the proposal was, well, you should have consumer, for, I mean, people do need to find out about products. Now, at this point, I don't know how they do it, because now everybody's buying online. Nobody goes to the malls anymore. But at the time we were originally writing this, um, said, well, we can still have malls. 
I mean, I was trying to get my poor students, you know, I was trying to convince them to support participatory economics. I mean, it was shameless. So I was trying to tell them, you can still go to the mall, but the mall is going to be run by your consumer federation. Um, and they're going to have all sorts of things that, you know, were new things on display there. And maybe you can, go, you can impulse buy if you want to impulse buy, you know, or you can just go and see it. I know that in Cuba, in Cuba, they did set up, they, they didn't call, I mean, they weren't shopping malls, but they basically would put on, they would periodically put on sort of a big show where they would display items that were going to be new items that were going to become available. And, you know, they would put them on show and they would, and people would go and visit that and be, that's how they would become aware of what's going to soon become available if they wanted to find out what's coming. Um, so I, I think that's uh, that's been our our suggestion has been that that should be the approach. And then the question is, well, if it's the consumer federations that are in charge of, first of all, the consumer federations are going to have their own research and development units that are responsible to them for doing research into new consumer products. Why don't we want the cons why don't we want the consumers to be in charge? of looking into new consumer products instead of having the producers be the ones that are doing all that research. So we, we essentially said, let's reverse, you know, who's in charge of that research. Let's reverse the whole question of who's in charge of presenting and showing people what's available, a, AKA advertising. So we wanted to take, my father was a miserable employee in the advertising industry. So I grew up very aware that there are two supposed purposes of advertising. One is a legitimate public service, which is making information, accurate information about product availabilities and capabilities available to the public. And the other is tricking them into thinking, to buy, into buying things they really don't want. So the goal here is you do have, you, we do have a, a legitimate service that needs to be provided and that's information. But we want to do it in a way that we don't have a terribly perverse incentive about who's in charge of it and what their motivations will inevitably be. It is a very interesting move, and I think very sensible, to try to eliminate that perverse incentive by an institutional measure rather than the classic, well, workers in the future won't use pernicious advertising tactics because they'll be lovely future socialist workers acting yep. in solidarity. And that the consumer federations would be in charge of that, I think is a very good idea. And in general, I imagine that it would eliminate the worst excesses. I'm just wondering, within that context, would there be any incentive for consumer federations to oversell. I mean, I suppose the thing that first enters my mind is that you'd say oversell to whom? Because they would really, for the most part, be overselling to themselves in a way. Right. That, that, that's, where I, that, that's why I think, I, I don't think you're wrong to worry about whether there's still going to be some perverse. What I would claim is, I think this proposal about switching who's in charge of this over to the Consumers Federation from the producers, it, that should take care of the bulk of the perverse incentive. I don't want to claim that there might not still be so, but I think that takes care of the bulk of it. But I, and I, but I also think, I mean, and, but I completely agree with your sentiment that what socialists have done in the past is whenever we get into a situation where some, somebody says, well, won't this bad thing happen? <laughs> Our answer is, no, but it won't be cat it's only capitalists who do bad things. Yeah. And once it's the workers that are in charge, they won't want to do these bad things. Well, yeah, but you're, I think it is reasonable to, re, it's reasonable to, in a participatory economy, anything that increases the social benefit to social cost ratio in one way or another makes life more pleasant or better for the workers' council. So I think it is it, and I think it's a very reasonable question to keep asking, you know, whether or not we have created an incentive for them to do something. They, they have the incentive. Anything that would have that effect, I think it's very important to ask. Anything that would have that effect, it's very important to worry about. And I don't want to dismiss it on the grounds that, oh, but these are workers. They're not capitalists. They wouldn't do that. 
and that and that is that is a difference between and, and I think that's that's sort of a fundamental methodological difference between how I and some of us have gone about you know trying to design a better system um, from the way that a lot of people who say I really like socialism have gone about it. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the way I think about it is it's really institutions. It's all about institutions. There are nuances, but really taking the long view of human society, it's almost like institutions are a glass and humans are the water. We're quite malleable. And it's also, you know, I mean, we see that in capitalism where so many of us, for example, as consumers, we don't want to participate in all sorts of destructive activities. But because the personal, narrow institutional interest is is, is misaligned with our personal preferences, these toxic behaviors happen anyway, because right. uh, we're trying to go against the grain of the institutions, as it were. And there's no reason to imagine that that won't also happen in a future society. There's another question about this issue. So it's about the workers' council side. So worker councils will have a strong incentive to convince consumers to purchase their products because this contributes to their social benefit score. What scope is there for workers' councils to use behavior modification techniques, aka advertising, to this end, even though consumer federations sell products to consumers and provide consumers with product information, could worker councils still have a significant effect? I'm thinking out loud here a little bit, okay? Sometimes workers' councils are selling to others' worker councils, and sometimes worker councils are sending, selling to actual consumers. And here's where I'm thinking out loud. Very few people worry about whether one business is hoodwinking another business. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I wonder, I mean, I don't know enough about the advertising industry to know. You would get the impression, the popular impression, if you take the popular mindset on this, you would assume that 80 to 90 percent of advertising budgets are ones where it's an enterprise it's a it's a capitalist company that's selling to a that's selling to consumers and that's where all their advertising is going on the other hand if what they're doing is selling to other businesses they don't bother advertising because they just can't hoodwink them i don't know if that's true or not but we do tend to think of the consumer as being you know the uniquely manipulable potentially the the uniquely the, the the actor who can be potentially manipulated. So I'm just, the, the thinking out loud part of this is, is this a problem? Is this a problem that's really unique to protecting consumers from this kind of predatory advertising? Um, or is it a general problem that anybody's selling to anybody, even if one business is selling to another business? In our case, one workers' council to another workers' council. Well, can I intervene just for sure. uh, momentarily? Yeah, actually, that's a very good point. I didn't even think about that. I think there definitely is, yes, there definitely is advertising directed at other businesses. I imagine that I imagine that this is very much the case. It doesn't necessarily take the same form, although sometimes it does. I mean, I know I switch on the radio and there's there are always advertisements saying, you know, if you want to improve this or that in your business, you know, go with uh, this insurer or this IT system or this security system or this. That's true. And there's, I imagine, a huge amount of money because of the nature of businesses. You know, when businesses tend to buy things, they tend to buy big. But then it probably also happens in, in other ways which consumers aren't exposed to. I suppose it's a very good point. I suppose you'd say that, yes, it's it's almost it's up for the worker federations to to protect themselves from that. I'm not sure, actually, but if you, if you want to jump in. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure either. I mean, what we've said about advertising, I'm trying to recall what we said about advertising. I mean, I suppose to begin with, if, if we split this into the production and the consumption side, that the question to ask, I mean, I'm trying to play devil's advocate and ask these difficult questions, but really the question to ask is when consumer federations are providing information directly to consumers, for ex you know, you could imagine something like Amazon, for example, being run by consumer federations with products. Right, that, that sh there should be no conflict of interest there. Yeah, because exactly. the consumer federation is basically governed by the consumers exactly. who That's it represents. Point. If the information is, if whoever is the, and we can actually generalize that, if the information is being provided, if the if the information about quality and characteristics of products are being provided is being provided by whoever the people who are the users or consumers of that is. 
then you've eliminated the perverse incentive for the producers to oversell. And it really doesn't matter whether or not the, the, the and I was thinking entirely in terms of, oh, the buyers are always consumer federations. And that's why I wanted to empower the consumer federations with the being, as those are the ones that are providing that information. We're not going to leave that to the, to the producers to do that. But there is a similar situation that you have, you have situations where some producers are buying from other producers. I mean, the analogy would be if you have automobile making companies buying steel from steel making companies, you want the automobile making companies to be providing information about the quality of the steel and the nature of the steel products, you know, to the automobile companies. You don't want the steel companies to be doing that. Yeah. I mean, okay, to, to, to move the consumption side out of the way, I, um, what I was getting at is one would ask why if there was this high quality information being provided and to, to be more concrete, we could imagine that there would be something like an Amazon, for example, provided by consumer federations where consumers would be provided with high quality information. There could be uh, in, the, in the book you talk about uh, consumer report and Nader's, uh, I think what was it, Nader's Raiders or something like right. that. Yeah. So so there, there would be people who would be whose job would, would be to test products to see how the reality measures up to whatever the producer councils had told them. So the question would be then, even if worker councils wanted to overhype their products and tell consumers lies, why would consumers want to or be inclined to listen to them in the first yeah, place? Think, why can't we basically just not... Why don't we disempower the workers' councils from being able to directly... They shouldn't be... there. They're not the ones that should be providing information about their products. It should basically be, per <clears throat> I think what I'm trying to do, I, I think the proposal amounts to, we want to institutionally protect the users of anything from manipulation. So, so suppose a steel company says, hey, but I mean, so we have a workers council that's making steel. And they say, but we really do have, we really do have this interesting steel product. And, you know, it's innovative. It's a little different from the other, you know, other, it's a little, our steel is a little different than the steel that you're getting from these other steel, you know, steel making workers councils. Well, they would basically have to make that case instead of going out and advertising, you know, in some, I suppose there's going to be journals that, you know, that are read by car making companies about whether we should be buying this kind of steel or that kind of steel. Instead of that, allowing them to be their self advertisers, they would have to, I think the idea is you want them to provide their information to an agency that represents the interests of all who might be, you know, who might be using it rather than they just simply directly act, try and directly access those people themselves. That's where it's the direct access to the buyer of your product that I think we want to substitute a different process for. We want to substitute a filter. We've got to provide a means by which workers' councils can describe their products and the advantages of their products to somebody. But I think we want to basically have this sort of intermediary so that we eliminate what is, you know, the manipulative part of advertising from the, it's really just information part. So then we empower the intermediary to then hear the case from the workers' council and then write up the description in Amazon or provide the information, you know, in, 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 in some sort of malls and displays, run the malls and displays where this stuff gets, I don't know. As, as I said in the beginning, um, no, 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 that's, I, that's only, I only go food shopping and I really yeah. am only interested in the meat section. And I actually don't pay for high quality meat because I can find meat I really like and I love getting it at low prices. So I am just not the person who ever thinks of any of these things. No, 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 it's good. It's good. It's interesting. And uh, what you said there is a very interesting, uh, concise way to summarize the issue about the problem being that direct connection between the producer and the consumer, whether that consumer is another workers council or that consumer is an actual uh, consumer. In this regard, there's one thing that I did think was sort of a very helpful suggestion that we made, which is right now, if you buy something from a capitalist firm, and it's not up to snuff, it's not what it was supposed to be, then you an individual consumer have to battle with that company about, you know, taking it back, reimbursing you. Now, I mean, 
And then we get into some companies will basically advertise themselves as great companies by saying, oh, we always or will if you're if the consumer isn't satisfied, we always take it back, which usually turns out to be actually a misrepresentation. They just say they do that. But in fact, they don't. So I kind of like the idea. I mean, one of the things we suggested that's a structural change in this dynamic, because the, there the problem is it's, it's a very unequal power dynamic. You have an individual consumer who's not satisfied. They'd have to personally take the time and energy to go and hassle with the company to take it back, give them a rebate, replace it, et cetera, et cetera. I like the idea that consumers can just turn all of that over to their federation. So anybody that gets delivery of something that, you know, they're not satisfied with, they just give it back to the federation. And then the federation, the consumer federation, on a more equal power footing, argues with it, argues with the producers federation about whether, no, no, this was below standard. This, you know, this was not what it was supposed to be. So I like the idea of, of sort of in any disputes over whether or not something was in truth what it was supposed to be, any disputes over that, I like to have that settled between roughly equal powerful groups. And as a person, I would love to be able to turn all of that over to my consumer federation. I'm not happy with this. I just hand it to them. And a week later, they tell me what the resolution is. And I just take whatever. I would trust them to do a better job of representing my interests than my own. And I also don't then for then and then I don't have to take the time to do it. So one of the one of the proposals is that one of the functions of these federations is to relieve individuals and particular unequal power situations from the inevitable hassles of something wasn't what somebody thought it was going to be. Absolutely. I mean, there's one word which illustrates this in the society that we live in, and that's Apple. I just think it's it's funny that, you know, we say that we live in a consumerist uh, society, but it's also a society where consumers have very little power. So we, as consumers, run around buying a huge amount of quantities of goods and services. But when it comes down to it, we actually don't have much power at all. Uh, I just mentioned Apple because, you know, they're notorious for being one of the wealthiest companies and in many ways producing great products, but also in other ways, really, you know, really screwing over consumers. You can't replace the battery. You can't replace the screen. There, there's just, you know, <laughs> there's, uh, you know, nothing. You can't see the source code for anything. Everything's proprietary. They have their own cable for everything. And if I, 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 as consumers were faced with a kind of game theoretic nightmare. I mean, you go into those kind of dynamics all um, in great detail when you're discussing the pollution damage re revealing mechanism, but it's the same kind of situation where nobody wants to be the first person to go after Apple and try to do something about it. So essentially it doesn't happen. That's right. If, if whoever puts in the time and energy to call them out is doing a tremendous service to everybody else, but you know, that's, it's, yes, there's, there's a perverse incentive not to do that. I mean, I think at some point, I'm, I'm not sure it got into the book or not, but I always was impressed with every company mouths the slogan, oh, the consumer is always correct, with equal insincerity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. So true. So some more questions about consumerism. So Paracon involves the buying and selling of, of consumer goods and services, albeit in a in a very different context. To what extent do you think that conspicuous consumption will persist? Yeah. We can throw the degrowth movement in here too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, and the other question, we can put the two of them together. Um, to what extent do you think that habits of just throwing goods away and buying a new one will persist? Uh, how can Paracon counter these tendencies? And maybe if you could explain what conspicuous consumption is to people who haven't encountered that phrase. Well, conspicuous consumption was a phrase that Thorsten Veblen came up with. And he is definitely one of my famous, uh, one of my favorite economists of all time. He, he's somebody, uh, he, the, the reason he is one of my favorite economists is he was very sensitive to how it was that, that, what, people, that what people wanted and didn't want was very influenced by the institutions in which you, when you put people down in one set of institutions, 
they want and don't want certain kinds of things. You put them down in a different set of institutions and you'd be, you'd be very, very surprised at just how differently, you know, people's preferences are. So the whole idea that institutions can bias and sort of warp the kinds of preferences that people come to have, which is sort of an important part of my theoretical economics work dating back to my graduate school days, it really just comes from an insight, you know, out of Thorsten Veblen. And, <clears throat> but he sort of got very concrete about it. He wasn't, and, and what he was very acute, because he, he was writing in the, in the robber baron era of American capitalism. And what he realized was that many people we're just consuming things to demonstrate, to, to, to sort of achieve status in society. That the purpose, it was almost better to overpay for something. Because if you overpaid for it, you had demonstrated your status in society as a higher wealth, higher income person. So it wasn't really that you wanted that good. It's that buying that good was a way of so that's what he meant by conspicuous consumption. You weren't consuming the thing because it had any real use value for you or utility for you. The utility it had for you was it conferred status on you compared to other people. And I, I mean, I think that's a very, very important concept. I think that's a very, very important. Now, so the real question reduces to in a participatory, in, in, in a healthy society, how would people go about achieving status in the eyes of others? Well, certainly in a socialist society, we would not, our vision isn't that you would, you would achieve status as being a higher income person or a person with greater wealth. So we're basically proposing, part of what we're proposing is changing society from the way that you impress other people with yourself as a human being is because you're wealthier and you can consume more that that was a sort of a crazy, terrible way that people achieved this goal under capitalism, and we're going to eliminate that. We're not going to have these huge differences in income and wealth. So then, well, how would people, you know, go? And so I think in part what the socialist vision is, and this is vision, in part what the socialist vision is, are people going to really not care what other people think of them anymore? Yeah, no, I don't think that's true. I mean, I don't think that's in the human gene. You know, that's not in our DNA. So people are going to care. But then the question is, well, how would you go about trying to win the esteem? You know, and our goal as socialists is, well, people would, we try, we want to create a society in which the way you try and earn the respect and the esteem of others is that you've done things that are socially valuable. In, in essence, it's sort of substituting one whole way for humans to earn the respect of others for what was really a kind of, a, what was brilliant about Beblin was he managed to write about it to make you understand what a sick, absurd way it was that people were going about trying to win the respect and esteem of other human beings. Um, and, and that's that, that, that comes into play when we're talking about, well, incentives to innovate. And we can come back to this in terms of, well, there's no patents anymore. So why would anybody try and innovate? Well, yeah. but innovators, innovators are doing something that's socially valuable. So if you have a society that has moved away from I'm going to be respected by others because of my conspicuous consumption instead to a society where, well, if I want to be respected by others, one way I could do it is if I happen to come up with a new innovation, you know, that's socially valuable, well, then people will know that and that's how it will get respect. Um, so I think that's part of, that's part of what we're imagining here. And that also to the extent that that has happened, um, that has implications, for instance, whether are we going to have to reward people beyond their sacrifices and efforts if they happen to come up with innovations? Well, if what people are getting respect from others for is the innovations they came up with, then you don't have to give them extra consumption for that. 
On the other hand, if that's not sufficient, if we haven't achieved in the evolution of a socialist economy, we haven't achieved enough of that to satisfy people and we're not getting enough innovation, well, then, may, then, then what I argue is you may discover that you would have to resort to what I would argue is an unfair system of material rewards for innovators because we haven't achieved the point where simply recognition for having come up with the social is a direct, is the direct reward of esteem and respect. We still have to substitute this material reward in order to induce enough innovation. And there's been so much concern with how the, the old cloggy social, uh, centrally planned socialist economies, you know, failed in terms of stimulating innovation, that I know this is a huge concern that a lot of people have. Is what you're proposing something that would be sufficiently innovative? Or would we once again lapse into just very, very low rates of innovation? And that's why I said, well, I the hope is that we now have gotten out of the crazy Veblen situation that he did just did such a brilliant job of, of making fun of. Um, and we've moved on to a sort of a system where sort of direct respect and esteem and appreciation for, for innovation. But if we haven't, there is a fallback. But I just think that fallback is something that should be decided through a democratic political process. How much of that do we still have to do? You know. The whole question of do we have to do it at all, um, I think should be sort of part of a democratic debate. And if people are feeling like maybe we need to do a little bit of it, um, then it, then that's the way it should be handled. But the goal should always be that we're moving away from that. Definitely. I mean, we're, I intend to get into innovation in detail. But before we do that, it is very interesting to think about what the material basis of conspicuous consumption is as we know it. I'm sure there will be some kind of conspicuous consumption forever, so to speak. I mean, even in hunter-gatherer societies, there's always some element of this, but it's of a completely, completely different character. And it's it's interesting to to wonder how much conspicuous consumption is even possible in a society where incomes and wealth are radically egalitarian. Can, can that even be sustain, sustained, and particularly in a culture where you don't have a mass brainwashing by producers to yes. to create preferences and personalities which pursue that. I, and I, I guess I'm, I'm thinking about how conspicuous consumption arises in that context, and I'm not sure where it can actually get a foothold. If income and wealth is very, very egalitarian, I think that you that's the major institutional barrier to the growth of the of the actually sort of psychologically sick behavior of conspicuous consumption. That's that's the big institutional barrier. And, and I think that, and, and, and the participant, I mean, and, and compared to any other model of socialism I know out there, I mean, the predictable degree of income and wealth inequality in a participatory economy has got to be lower than any other model of socialism that I'm aware of. So I, I think that in some sense, if there's any if there's any economic proposal that is immune to this problem, this would be the most likely. And what you're saying is, well, is being the most immune doesn't mean you're entirely immune. And I, I wouldn't dispute that. Yeah, well, look, bring this back to engineering. In engineering, there's no such thing as zero. There's only, <laughs> z there just isn't. Don't know what that is. It's, it's always 0. 0.000 something. So uh, I'm not interested in zero. I'm not interested in perfection. It's about dealing with the largest problems and then uh, you can make the refinements once you are lucky enough to get there. Um, what about the matter of a, a, a disposable culture, a throwaway culture? You know, fast fashion, and we, we can we can. It, it doesn't matter if I if I don't get this repaired. You know, people don't repair things anymore because uh, why bother getting repaired? Because that costs as much as it does to get a brand new version. My answer to that is if we if we incorporate all the externalities, which is a huge huge part of what we've proposed and sort of proposed very concrete mechanisms for how to get them, you know, how to, how to estimate their magnitude and how to get them included into the social costs that everybody has to take into account. That's my big, that's my, that's essentially my answer to that. That's incredibly inefficient because somebody has not incorporated the costs, you know, of the throwaway and the cleanup. Um, and if, I think if you take care of the externalities that that basically is, you know, the, the, the solution to that. There's a part, 
at some point we, we should take the conversation into in terms in the direction of because consumption over consumption and sort of the whole degrowth you know phenomena is that they are related to one another as is the throwaway stuff there's a question about uh but uh, that's that come um you know, I've, I've broken them into sections. There's an ecology. I'll wait for you to get there. Well, no, it's, if you want to make some preliminary comments, that's fine. But there's an ecology section, and there's there's a whole part about how can a participatory economy facilitate a zero growth or a degrowth economy versus, say, a market which has a growth imperative. But um, so I, I just wanted to say, don't worry, we will okay, absolutely that's get okay. there. Okay, then then go, proceed and proceed along your agenda, and we'll get to, it, we'll we'll get to it. That's fine. Here's the thing I'll throw in. Yeah. I envision in a in a participatory economy, yeah. I think material standards of living will continue to rise at a healthy rate forever for the human beings living in this. And that's where there's a certain interpretation and presentation of degrowth that assumes that's impossible, that's in, that that is environmentally impossible and I think they are absolutely crazy. They are absolutely wrong. There is no reason that we we, I do not believe we have to preach to the world. You are just going to have to accept no, no significant rise in, in material standards of living for humanity because unless you accept that, the environment will be destroyed. I think that's uh, so, so. So I'm just going to sort of throw out there that I am proposing that if we have a participatory economy, people will enjoy. A nice healthy rise in the average material standard of living for human beings and because the income distribution will be more egalitarian than ever that rise will be something that everybody enjoys that we do not have to accept the fact that we will no longer have any increasing you know, that our that our living sta our economic living standards will no longer continue to increase but anyway we can come back to that yeah, well, that's a very enticing assertion, and that's an incentive for viewers to hang on until we get to that and, and discuss and, and reveal the arguments for that. That's right. It doesn't have to be doom. I am not preaching doom and gloom. <laughs> Only if we don't wake up and do something sensible, but not because it's inevitable, we'll have to accept it. Go ahead. There's another question about consumption, and that is about consumer federations competing with each other. So the question is, is there competition between consumer federations hoarding information, for example, or trying to attack members with higher effort ratings? And if consumer federations are pushing to sell all their merchandise, does that mean that, say, shopping centers will be competing for customers or online shops will be competing for customers? I honestly don't see a problem here. I'm not... So let, let's just go through, let's go back through them one by one. Yeah. Is there competition between consumer federations? So, for example, hoarding... To get members with higher effort ratings. Yes, yes, that was one. Yeah. Okay. Well, the consumer federations are geographically based. So, I mean, a consumer federation would be, what, maybe 10,000 people, maybe 3,000 families. And they are basically in a, in a geographical area. So they don't compete for members. Their members are fixed by the fact that they live in that neighborhood. Um, I also don't know what advantage it would be to a consumer federation to have people with higher effort ratings to the federation itself. If on average, the people in a, I mean, I, I think there will be differences in the average effort rating of different consumer federations. And that does in fact mean that all the residents of that consumer, fe suppose, suppose, you're, suppose you're in a consumer federation where the average effort rating is 5% lower than the national average. Well then the social value of the goods that everybody in that neighborhood is gonna be consuming is gonna be 5% less than the national average. Now, supposedly that's fair because their effort ratings were 5% less and they basically made the choice that they wanted to be more leisurely about things and cared less about what they had to consume. But, um, but that's the way it works. And so I don't see a real problem there. 
It wouldn't really, what would be, I, I can't see what the advantage to a consumer federation would be of recruiting um, high effort members. I mean, I guess you could say, well, a high effort member, you know, might have a nicer house on the block and then the whole neighborhood and the whole street is a little nicer, but differences in effort, differences in effort ratings and income are going to be small enough. So we're really not worried about is my neighborhood a ghetto versus, you know, yeah. you know, versus, uh, um, walled estates there there aren't going to be neighborhoods with walled estates and neighbor, neighborhoods with ghettos so i i don't think that's a i honestly don't think that's a problem okay yeah yeah if, if the variations in effort ratings are are relatively small then there isn't much of an issue there and the people in a neighborhood i mean it, when the in a neighborhood council if you have if you have ten thousand people living in a neighborhood council and maybe half of them have jobs those 5,000 people are working in different workers' councils. So it's not like, oh, well, you have a workers' council with a low effort rating and everybody in the neighborhood works there. So if, if people in one neighbor, if, if people in one consumer council ended up with an average effort rating 5% below some other neighborhood consumption council, that would have been the outcome of people in both places working in hundreds of different worker councils and it just turned out, you know, that in the neighborhood, there was a 5% difference in the average effort rating people had gotten in their workplaces, where everybody's working in very different workplaces. Okay. Really, that issue is more of an issue about the effort rating income uh, calculation distribution process. In, and yeah, how that between functions. worker councils and within worker councils, exactly. That's where there really is a serious issue. I mean that that that's where the discussion needs to be because that is that is a very that 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 issue does require attention. Yes, and we'll we'll get there. Um, and and then also dealing with um, with statistical effects that will uh, deal with a, a lot of the the issue there when you're looking at populations, significant populations. And just on that last point of, for example, shopping centres competing with one another they all want to clear their products their goods and services so would there be a, a competition between different consumer federations running say shopping centers in different areas of a city or so anything like that i'm gonna be really i mean quite honestly i just never shop so <laughs> i didn't think you were gonna say i that. don't even shop online <laughs> yeah i don't even i don't even shop on amazon i mean yeah. Yeah, when I have six children and three grandchildren, when birthdays come around, yeah, then I have to have somebody show me how to go on Amazon and you know get something shipped someplace. Um, look, what I what I always imagined was is that that there's all these goods that the people in a neighborhood consumption council, you know, have said. We put in our proposals; it's been approved. We're going to be consuming these things during the year. Well, there has to be a distribution center. So I always imagine there'll be a distribution center where this, you know, someplace in the neighborhood or close to the neighborhood where all this stuff gets sent, where they go to pick it up. Can I intervene um, just on that for, yeah. for clarification? So would you say then that, because this, this was a question I was going to ask, but I thought maybe it's not worth asking that most consumption at the household level would occur regionally locally would be it wouldn't why would you want to go to a distribution center that is a 40 mile drive instead of the one that's closest to you and then i mean we might have some items where the distribution center is covering five neighborhood councils and at you know the warehouse and the place you go to pick them up whereas the grocery store I mean, think of it now. We have we have grocery stores, and then we have corner markets, and then we have malls. And you go to those different places to get different categories of goods. Um, so, in in that sense, I think we would still have different sizes for different category of goods, actual physical distribution centers. But I always imagine those as being run by the consumer councils. I suppose, do you see that there's, if I understand it correctly, the plan, the annual plan establishes more or less the consumption schedule for the year, but... It doesn't say, it, it, the annual plan doesn't say 
how the goods that are produced actually get to the people who end up using them during the year. So, so what we're talking about is, well, but then how does that happen? And my honest answer is, I don't give a shit. <laughs> that was my honest answer. But, you, but, but it's a reasonable question to ask. Yeah. And so my second honest answer is, well, ask somebody else. That can't be that hard to work out. But okay. now you've asked me to say, well, but could that work out? And I'm just sort of thinking out loud, but yeah, <laughs> they go to distribution centers and people go to pick them up. The more complicated thing is, in my mind, is what if people during the year start to pick up different amounts of things than what they were pre-approved for? And then how do you make those adjustments? Now, that 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 I took upon myself as, well, that's a serious question that, you know, that somebody has got to try and provide a serious answer to. But the short answer always was, I just imagine that the consumer councils and their federations are managing these, what I just think of as distribution centers where different things are sent. And the people who've been authorized to consume that stuff are going and picking it up as conveniently as possible. All this was written before, you know, everybody is so afraid you, you can't go into a store and Uber is dropping off your food. And if Uber won't do it, Safeway will do it for you for a small charge. I mean, yeah. we're living in a whole new world about how things are being, how people are picking things up. And I don't know, maybe it's a better world. Maybe it's a worse world, but I'm the person that never shopped. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so can I just clarify for my own benefit? It, it was my understanding that consumers would, at the point of actually obtaining the good or the service okay, that they had put in their request for, but when they actually go, come to realize that request, they need to pay for that on the spot, yep. as it were, okay, right, out of their their income. Okay. And so I suppose I'm just asking, do you, so you don't think then that there would be much of price competition between, for example, I might have put in a request during the year to my uh, consumer council, but then I see that maybe, you know, on the other side of the city or something like that, I see that the thing that I wanted is being sold there at maybe a slightly lower price because because they're trying to clear things and you know it, it's an imperfect i don't think that's the problem you're not going to find a better price at a different location okay um but you are good but but there is a i mean here, th this is a situation that that will arise yeah so i put in my consumption request and it was approved but during the year i end up doing something different and that means that for some items when i go in and I get them and they charge me on my swipe card. I pick up more of some items than I was approved for. And I pick up less of other items that I was assumed, that I was approved for. So there is a real question of, well, how do we, what do we do then? How do we make the, how do we adjust for that? And the big question is, I mean, the, the, the really big question is, do we use price? Do we adjust the prices in that case or not? And if so, why and how? And I actually do write a decent amount about that sort of, you know, in democratic economic planning. In, in the best of all worlds, when you pick up less of an item and I pick up more of an item from our own distribution center, they cancel each other out. We'll be charged different amounts. And that'll basically mean that in your bank account, you have maybe overspent what you were allocated for. You've either done a little borrowing or you've actually saved some. And I do talk about the borrowing and the saving. And the saving is easy. Anytime somebody's purchases end up being, well, wait a minute, you didn't buy everything you were you were authorized for. Um, then you've saved and it just goes into an account, then you've saved. On the other hand, the, and the borrowing isn't a problem unless it gets to the point where you have no credible there's no credible way you are actually going to pay back for all that borrowing by consuming less in the future than you're authorized for during that year than your income. And then we have to talk about, well, what banks, although in, I, in, in our case, I think it's more like credit unions, what their real job is, is to basically just monitor and see whether or not somebody who is spending more, in fact, spending more than their their allocated income year after year after year, and it's gotten to the point where it's very obvious that this is not something they're going to be able to repay, then what do you do about that? And that's where I think credit unions with their sort of standard 
monitoring of that kind of behavior have to come in. But 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 basically, the system. I mean, the system. The, the system is certainly flexible enough so that people will change their minds during the year. When they do change their minds, then basically that will amount to they will either borrow or save as compared to using exactly their income for the year. Um, that's okay. We can take care of what I would call bad faith borrowing. In any system that allows borrowing, you have to have some mechanism or institution that is take, that is monitoring borrowing to see whether it's bad faith or good faith borrowing. And then there has to be somebody that steps in and does something about it and brings it to a halt. But I don't think that's rocket science. And the tricky part is do... In the end, we in the end we have to have the actual matching of the supply and the demand, and do we use price adjustments to do that? Um, and do we also? Here's the other. Here's the other thing that I think is sort of a. It's a policy issue that would have to be discussed and debated. Um, if we run into a situation where, on average, people have have picked up during the year more than the collective order was, well, then we're going to have an aggregate shortage of a thing. And should people who have, should people who have ordered a certain amount get priority over people who are just coming in and now saying, I want more of that than I actually had in my proposal. And essentially you can use price adjustments to take care of this, or you can use, well, but they put in the proposal. So if we're going to run out of shoes, then they get the shoes and you have to wait because you actually didn't put in a proposal for that many shoes. So there's sort of two different ways of taking care of it. And there's pros and cons to both, I suppose. There are. I mean, we'll, we will go into that at another time. But I think um, there is certainly one advantage, I think, in it's effectively one is a rationing. Well, I suppose it's all rationing, really. But one is a kind of typical what's called rationing system right. um, one is a rationing and the other is you make the price adjustments and and and, yeah. and and we traditionally don't call that rationing yeah but yeah which is funny <laughs> but it, it is this funny thing of well what do you think rationing is rationing is when there's a certain amount and you have a way to decide who gets it and who doesn't get it um which is the hilarious thing that pe people think that in a market society or in capitalism there's no rationing but of course right when what, you put a, when you put a price on something that i can't afford guess what you've just rationed me yeah. out of it <laughs> yeah, there's also, this is a complete aside, but it's also, um, look, uh, w when people foam at the mouth about the social credit system in China, now I'm not a uncritical defender of, of China, that's not what I'm getting at, but talk about how the social credit system is, it, it's so um, dystopian uh, and you're not allowed to do certain things depending on the way you behave or what you think. And I, I just think, hmm, <laughs> there's a social credit system, there, there's some kind of score attributed to you where you know, depending on the way that you behave, which determines what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do. Oh, and, right. No, yeah. I know what you're talking about now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Money, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you know, That's right. yeah. Oh, oh, yes. We have a social credit system. But um, that point that you're making, though, about underwriting, I mean, for, from what I read about finance, it seems that, like you said, it's not rocket science. It seems to be the hardest part is actually making sure that it is done. And that it's not a situation where uh, criminals take over and make sure that there's no underwriting at all and turning finance into, into a total scam. But the principles of underwriting, way to do it, is, is not that complicated when you're talking about um, good and bad faith borrowing. Right. So good and bad faith borrowing. I mean, I have, one of my daughters works for a credit union and she's worked in the collections department and she's worked in the loans department. And yeah. I mean, there are members of the credit union that basically are extended credit, and then it turns out, well, they just can't pay it. And sometimes it's an accident, and sometimes there's an easy way to fix it, you know, in terms of, oh, well, you're going to pay it back, but it's going to be over a longer period of time. We're going to basically, let, we're going to give you an extension of time. And then, you know, but frequently, I mean, the first step that has to be taken is, um, well, we're not going to let you do that again next year. You know, when you defaulted on a car loan from your credit union, then you don't get to put in, you don't get to do it again the next year. 
And it isn't rocket science to have people in the credit union to figure that one out and know who we have to stop from continuing this or this this dishonest, basically a dishonest representation of their intentions or a totally unrealistic ability for them to, you know, assess their own situation. It doesn't have to be sort of, it can be malevolent or it can just be irresponsible, but we have systems where people, actual employees of, of a workplace know how to go about this. Yes, absolutely. I mean, life is a lot, life and finance are a lot simpler when it is not just a giant scam. I I really don't think that if, I I think that if Donald Trump had had to apply to participatory economy credit unions for the kind of credit that he, (laughs) that, that he has accumulated, I do not think he would have gotten away with all of the shenanigans he has during his entire business life. Um, Indeed. I I just want to say one thing I meant to say about the rationing. I think one argument in favor of that is that where people who had entered a certain good or service into their consumption proposal in advance is that it would encourage people to be more accurate in their proposal. Yes. If, if the, if the answer, if the, if, if the solution was people who had it in the proposal get priority over people who didn't, yeah. um, that that would that would provide an incentive for trying to be more careful about what you know your your actual proposal. It would also disadvantage me because I know that I would be very <laughs> lackadaisical about putting my proposal in. And when I got there and they said, "But you didn't actually ask for this, and this person did, and therefore you're going to have to wait," I would be the first one to be told I'd have to wait. <laughs> And I would decide that's okay because I just don't want to take the time to think too much about my annual consumption proposal anyway. I was this take last year and add five percent for everything because I think I'm going to have a higher effort rating. <laughs> that would be the way I would do it. Your distaste for shopping and consumption would persist even in a even in utopia. Even in that context, yes, yeah. it is. Okay, so we can leave the questions there. You'll be happy to know that there's only one question left about shopping. So the torture okay. will end after that. Um, so you've given me so much of your time. So I'm really grateful. I'm really, okay. uh, um, it's been a f- wonderful discussion. We will continue this. Thank Sounds good to me. All righty. Okay. Have a good evening. Yeah, you too. Or okay. Afternoon. That's the end of part B of my first interview with Professor Robin Hanel about participatory economics and his latest book, Democratic Economic Planning. Stay tuned for our upcoming second interview. And as always, I want to hear your thoughts in the comments section below. That's all for now. The only viable future for humanity is one after the oligarchy.